All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming tonight. This is the November uh, Astro Cafe where we talk about how to buy a telescope because uh, it's the upcoming holiday season and people start thinking about buying telescopes either as a gift or for themselves. And so we like to do uh, this uh, to try and help people uh, make a good decision, make a good uh, purchase. Uh, this is um, geared towards people that are maybe you know, new to the hobby or possibly uh, first time buyers. Uh, it's not really intended for uh, very experienced uh, people that have already gone through many telescopes. This is really how to get into, into the hobby. And we mainly focus on, uh, I'm mainly focusing on using telescopes with your eyes. So for visual observing, as opposed to uh, spending, a, a, as, opposed to an as opposed to an emphasis on attaching a camera. But I do touch on the astrophotography uh, part of it, uh, and there may be upcoming cafes on uh, on a similar vein uh, in astrophotography, but this one will be mainly visual. And the idea here is to try and help you make a good decision uh, to buy a good first telescope, as opposed to not buying a hobby killer. Right uh, phrase we like to use uh, on the number of telescopes that each and every year are on the market, um, and do not lend themselves to a good first experience uh, using, a using a telescope. And it can, in fact, can kind of kill a hobby uh, before it even gets going. And that's the last thing we want to see uh, yeah, that happen to people. So this is what we're going to focus on. And so there's a bit of an overview on telescopes that we'll talk about and how they work. Um, then we'll move into some, uh, some aspects or features of telescopes that are important when trying to decide how to buy, and we'll look at different uh, telescopes and different price points and, and classes. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to take a little roundup through some of the vendor websites uh, and also what's available on the used market right uh, on the web right now. And then I'll make some comments about, uh, about some things. Um, there's been a big change since last year's cafe. Uh, everybody's probably heard the word, uh, the term supply chain issues. Uh, in the last while, and astronomy is not immune to those, especially a telescope buying. You'll see what I mean as we get into um, the, the categories and types of telescopes. So, we'll start with a, with a bit of an overview on the on the type of telescopes. They they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors and uh, and accoutrement and all those kinds of things. But they really really all boil down to three basic types: a refractor on the top left, a reflector on the top right. And something that I'm just going to call a compound telescope, which is a merger of, uh, of those two types. Uh, it can go by other names, and I'll talk a little bit about them in the next slide. So we'll just review each of those three types. So the first one's a refractor, and this is a type of telescope that uses only lenses to bring the light to your eyes. You can see a little animation there of the light path. The light comes in at the front end through a lens and then starts to get focused down, and it travels through the tube makes a right-hand turn, usually at the back of the telescope so that you can go out uh, 90 degrees out to an eyepiece so that it makes it for convenient viewing positions. A lot of times we aim these telescopes up in the sky as opposed to looking at terrestrial scenes like trees and mountains and birds. So you, on this type of telescope, it's important that you have a diagonal at the back to bend the light so that way you can, your eye is comfortable. You don't have to use them to lean into the eyepiece as opposed to having to uh, get down on the ground, either on your knees or lying down to actually look through it, depending on how tall it is. But it's basically lenses only, right? And this is the type of telescope that was first invented and first kind of put to astronomical use by Galileo over 400 years ago. The next kind is a reflector and it uses mirrors to do the same thing, bring light to your eyepiece. So comes in the front, but it goes down the bottom of the tube and hits a mirror, which reflects it back to a second little mirror that you can see uh, on the left-hand side. And that makes the right-hand turn to bend the light and send it through an eyepiece uh, for, you looking through, to, for you to look through. So this one's mirrors only until it uh, hits your eye. And this type of telescope was invented by Isaac Newton. And so sometimes it's called a Newtonian uh, telescope, uh, but it's a reflector because it reflects light as opposed to the lenses which refract or bend light. And the last type is the compound, uh, which is a combination of the two. There's a lens at the front on the left there, light comes in, uh, bounces off a mirror at the back, goes back towards the front, bounces off a second mirror, which sends, which sends it down a, another thin tube, usually in the middle called a baffle, and which is through a hole in the main mirror, 
and then takes the right hand turn and goes to the eyepiece. So this one, the big, the big thing with this thing is it keeps the size small in a compact, look at, look at the length of the, the travel length. It's going through that tube three times. So rather than having a telescope tube that's three times the length, you get it for about one third the length, making them for a more compact package. Uh, for for ease of use and portability, there are other uh, there are other factors that, uh, in terms of controlling uh, how the telescope optics work, which I won't get into here. But that's the kind you'll see. And so I call it compound. It could be called uh, by some trade names or some types called Schmidt Cassegrain or Maxutov or Mac Cass. You'll hear those kinds are. Uh, you'll hear those kinds of terms of compound or even the other ugly word catadioptric. Uh, but anyway, the point here is that it's got lenses and mirrors. So those are the three main types. And every telescope you see we discussed tonight will be one of those three types, no matter what the size or the price. So they're going to cover four main things about a telescope that you want to look at when making a decision. The first one is aperture, which is the size or the diameter of the mirror or lens. We're going to talk about magnification only for educational purposes, is that is a function of what the telescope does, but it's not the most important function. And it's, but it's usually the function that's uh, advertised the big, the best on a lot of boxes of telescopes that you should not buy when, when magnific is it. And that's, and so even though magnification is something you wanna do, the claims of high manufacture, high magnification are things that you want to, uh, you want to avoid, but I wanna talk about that. And I also want to talk about the mount. This is what the telescope sits on. You know, usually a combination of a tripod or other type of a support system, and then some create some some way to attach the telescope to that tripod or, or support. And that's what holds your telescope and also allows you to move it so you can aim it at different objects. And that's a very important feature of a telescope. Almost as important as the aperture, because if it's if it's weak or undersized or wobbly, it then it's it uh, lends itself to too much frustration and you can't see anything or you can't, you don't have a pleasing experience. And so what's the point, right? And the last um, <clears throat> of the four things I wanna talk about is accessories. There are some key accessories that you should have with your telescope. A lot of, tel <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of telescopes come with these, not always. And so you might be having to buy some and I'll talk about some of the more important ones. So aperture. Well, in astronomy, in terms of telescopes, size does matter. And the aperture, which is the diameter of the lens or the mirror, determines the light gathering power. The more light you can gather, the more you can see, right? So you can see more faint, you can see fainter objects. You can resolve or make clear smaller objects. And you can also uh, magnify the view, the view more. So it's very, it's, it's the most important uh, uh, specification uh, of a telescope. Uh, when considering all the features. So size does matter. So that, as I said, it's the diameter of the main lens or mirror. And I've made a little chart here of the typical sizes of telescopes that you find on the market all the time. In the refractor style, they generally range for, and this is for consumer level use, right? Non-professional, uh, three to six inches in diameter. Reflectors start at about four and a half. You can get smaller ones, but I didn't bother listing them. Small reflectors that start at four and a half inch diameter, six and eight, and then, and then 10, 12, 14, and 16 inches. Those are you'll find uh, those kinds of apertures in the market almost all the time. And on the compound side, well, it covers pretty well the same range uh, as the reflector, going down to as little as three and a half, but otherwise the same ranges uh, as reflector. Notice how well the refractors top out at six inches. You can get bigger ones, but the price of those things is well beyond the scope pardon the pun, of this workshop. So on the left-hand side, costs go down. And on towards the right-hand side of this chart, costs go up, right? It's just, it's just the way it is. More, more glass and more things that you need to, uh, uh, more optics that you need to put into the telescope, the higher the cost, right? Also, the size and the weight is lower on the left and higher on the right. Um, we got uh, somebody in the waiting room, Jeff. And... Um, so I got that's, those, those are important considerations uh, when looking at the sizes. But I'm gonna take a few off this chart because for tonight's purposes, I'm gonna to talk about the smaller refractors 
uh, only up to 10 inches on the reflectors and, and probably about eight or so uh, inches on the compound telescopes. Because the ones that I've put, uh, that I've grayed out, they're, they're available uh, and they can, they can be just as good uh, as any, any of the other sizes, but they get into price points that I didn't really want to cover, uh, especially for the first time buyer or somebody new to the hobby. They get, they're big and they're expensive. So uh, leaving those out of discussion, but we still have a very good range of sizes here for aperture to consider. So that's what you're gonna see in the market. Magnification, so that's determined by the eyepiece, whether it's a three inch refractor or an eight inch reflector, uh, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't determine the magnification. What determines the magnification is the eyepiece you put in um, in combination with those optics or the size of that mirror or lens um, that determines how much you're going to magnify what you can see. And the rule of thumb for maximum aperture um, is generally around 50 times the number of inches of aperture. So if you have a three inch telescope, you'd be looking at about 150 times magnification as the maximum you could use uh, uh, and still get a reasonable image uh, through the telescope. If you have a 10 inch telescope, you could go to 500 power. It's just determined by that simple multiplier. A lot of times you'll, as a, you'll see later that uh, sometimes telescopes are advertising or are, being, are advertised with the magnification as the single most important number to try to get you to buy that telescope. And that's not the one you want to focus on, but these are the kinds of magnifications that um, you want to you consider using depending on the size of your telescope, but there's a big caveat to all of this, and that is that the atmosphere you're looking through generally does not permit the highest magnification that a telescope could achieve based on its size. So you'll be generally operate at that 500 uh, top end for the 10 inch telescope. It's rare the night that you'll be able to use that uh, all night uh, and look at things, right? Generally speaking, uh, you're, you're, you're observing at a much lower magnification. I find myself observing a lot, uh, especially for the, the deep sky things like galaxies and nebulae um, and clusters at about 100 to 150 power. I do the vast majority of my observing for that. If the atmosphere does permit it and you're looking at planets and you really wanna boost the magnification, you can get to do it. But generally speaking, the, mag the atmosphere doesn't permit those. So be, be wary of the highest magnifications or when you're selecting eyepieces, as we'll talk about later. Um, you want to you want to stay in the range. Don't push that 50x per inch. You know I would stay well below for reasonable performance. All right. So lower mag. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention: lower mag can show more detail than higher mag sometimes. And why is that? Well, if the atmosphere is not permitting it very well, and and or you're pushing past the the size limit of your telescope, uh, things will just get blurry faster. Uh, and sometimes on a lower magnification. It's slightly, sh it, even though it's smaller, it can be slightly sharper, right? Also, as you magnify, you are dimming the image. And so you may be getting better contrast against the background sky if you're observing out in the country, but you are also dimming, making the image dimmer the higher the magnification. And there are other, there are other factors. If your telescope doesn't track, things will drift out of the field of view faster. So you got to keep moving the telescope to keep looking at something and things like that. So magnification is, it, is an important consideration, but not the most important. Aperture is, that's, is, is it, and that's why we started there. So mount, the thing your, your telescope will sit on. Uh, generally, when you buy a telescope, it comes with a mount. Sometimes you can buy the telescope by itself and then put it on your own mount but they boil down to three basic types with two basic types of movements. Uh, the one on the left is called ALT-AS for altitude and azimuth, and it works like a camera tripod. You can see the picture there. There's a telescope on, mounted on what looks like a camera tripod, and you can move the telescope horizontally, left and right, or horizontally, or up and down in altitude, and that's how you aim it. Uh, and that's a very simple and easy type of mount uh, to use. The one in the middle is called Dobsonian, and it is an Altaz as well. It has the same kind of motions uh, horizontally in a circle, right, or up and down. But it, the telescope, and it's usually, and you almost, almost always find this on a reflector only type of telescope. The Dobsonian mount is for a reflector, and it, it makes for the smoothest motions in easiest ways to move 
a reflector, especially on the bigger sizes for aiming purposes. It keeps it lower to the ground than what, what a tripod would do. And so this was a type of mount that came uh, popularized in the, in, the, in the 70s and really changed the way uh, amateur astronomy was able to use reflectors. Before they were mounted on, uh, on other types of mounts and they weren't as easy to use. So this really made a change. And you'll see that's a very popular type of telescope to buy. All sorts of sizes, uh, but especially this type of mount is great uh, for uh, the larger ones. On the right is something called an equatorial mount. And you can, and it is usually is on a tripod as well. And it has, you know, it has motions similar to aiming, but the horizontal motion is now at an angle uh, and it's called, uh, and, and it's, and, and so it, it turns not horizontally, but at an angle and an angle is determined by your latitude or by how you've aimed this mount at Polaris, the North Star, if you're in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and, and then for declination, uh, it is an up and down type of mount, but not always up and down. It depends on where you're, which part of the sky you're aiming at. The, the giveaway, is, well, how you can tell it's equatorial is that usually there's a shaft with a counterweight. You can see there's a counterweight there below the telescope, uh, below, just, down to, just down from the orange line. There's a counterweight there and that's an equatorial mount. It has different, that's the classic mount uh, for astronomy. Uh, and that's, that's the third kind you will see tel telescopes um, sold as, and a lot of times the smaller telescopes, reflectors and refractors are both sold uh, in the smaller sizes quite often with an equatorial mount. So let's look at these three in a bit more detail. So the Altaz mount, right? This is, uh, you can get them in two kinds, manual where you, uh, you mount the telescope uh, on, this, on this mount and you can move it, you have to move it yourself. Uh, and then you have uh, some knobs for for, uh, for fine control for, for small movements, right? Up and down, left and right. Or you can get it to be tracking like the one on the right. So that's motorized, uh, will we'll turn on its own to track, uh, to counter the Earth's rotation. It's also this one, generally if they're tracking, they're also computerized, which they come with a controller. You can see a hand paddle there mounted to one of the legs and that will allow you to dial in what you wanna see and the telescope will find it for you. So that's called go-to. Uh, so that often a tracking mount. But these have the basic motions of up and down, left and right. They're intuitively easy to use, quite easy to set up. And if you have a fairly small scope and a fairly small tripod mount, you can set these up very quickly if you have the inclination to uh, go do some astronomy without taking a lot of time to set things up. So these, I call these, this is a good type of mount uh, for a first time user on a telescope. That's a good mount. Dobsonian is that type of mount for reflectors. Again, they come in both styles, manual or tracking. There's a classic one, a, a solid tube reflector on the left, mounted on a, and you just, you just turn it on that turntable base uh, horizontally, and then you uh, pull, pull, push it up and down in order to find what you want to look at. Um, and you generally are just pushing it uh, slightly away from you in order to track something in the sky. The tracking mount on the right, similar thing, motorized and computerized. The tube is different. You'll see that on that reflector, the tube is different. This one has a collapsible tube so that it can be smaller for in your vehicle when you're taking it somewhere. Uh, but otherwise you have to extend the tube uh, to position the mirrors in the right spots. And, uh, but it, it does the same thing. It'll uh, left and right, up and down, but you can, motor, uh, you can have it move it set by itself and find things by itself. This, on the Skywatcher line, uh, this is a Skywatcher example on this one and also on its equivalent, the Orion, which you'll see later. You can also move those by hand. Uh, in addition, even while it's tracking, you can decide to move it by hand uh, and then it'll continue tracking from where it is. So, so those are very good mounts for bigger telescopes, uh, uh, reflectors. And, the, and so they're good mounts as well. The last kind of mount, which you'll often see sold with the smaller telescopes, both reflectors, and refractors is called this equatorial. There's a couple of examples, uh, refractor on the left by Orion, and then something by a company called Vision, I, Vision something, I don't know, C-I-N-G, I don't know, some, some name. And uh, those are mounted and you can see that they have the knobs for moving it up and uh, for moving it. And there's that shaft extending down parallel to one of those tripod legs. And that's got a counterweight system. So that's the giveaway that, that is an equatorial mount. These 
Some may, some may, some people may differ with this opinion, but I'm going to stand by the statement that this type of mount is a hobby killer. This is the kind of mount that has killed more hob, more people getting started in, hob, in astronomy than any other types. Quite often, what happens is unless you buy a really good one, they are undersized, they're flimsy, and so they're very, very wobbly. And you, you, you cannot find things easily, and you can't keep them in the eyepiece easily, uh, and the, you can't get the you can't get the view to settle down and stay still. Uh, secondly, the movements are unintuitive. They don't follow the movements of your body up, down, left, and right. They follow the movement of the of the sky, which is which is uh, which is, which is different. And sometimes the wind, depending on where you have to point the telescope, sometimes the mount can get between you and the telescope, so ease of use goes down. Um, and so, and you have to balance them, otherwise it's a problem to use them if they're not very well balanced. A lot of these issues don't uh, don't exist or are very minor in the other types of mounts. So it's not the type of mount I would suggest getting for the, the novice astronomer or the first time telescope buyer. Um, and uh, so Altaz, yes. Dobsonian, yes. Equatorial, no. I said we're going to cover a little bit on accessories. So I want to talk about three types of things. Uh, finder, an eyepiece, the eyepieces, and then if you're going to think about a reflector, a collimation tool. So let's look at finders. So a finder is something that helps you aim the telescope. It's either a little low power, like a finder scope, a low power wide angle telescope, similar to a rifle scope, or it's sort of something called a red dot finder, which is a naked eye device. Both of them lets you aim the telescope because when you look through a telescope, even at the lowest powers, you are looking through a very, a very, very, very small part of the sky. You can't just aim it very easily by looking down the tube, right? You need a finder. And so it's a necessity to find things uh, when you're navigating around the sky. So there's some pictures of what they look like, right? On the left are the optical finder scopes. So the top one is, a, is, they're both little refractors, right? And the top one bends the light so that you, your eyepiece is in a convenient position. And um, you can get them where they have a reversed view so that uh, it doesn't it, 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 like like you would have on a, through a telescope with the, where the view is reversed, or it could be uh, it could be a correct image which will show you a, a, a large section of the sky with uh, uh, that's not backwards or upside down. Right, the, the the bottom one is a straight through. You don't bend the light. You look through it, so it's going to have a left right. Uh, uh, it's going to have a mirror image uh, left to right uh, to show you things. But those are optical ones. On the right are the red dot finders. They generally have a little something that projects a little red dot of, sky, uh, uh, of light into the sky. And so on the, you, look, you look through the little window, like on the right, you look through the, um, the circular thing on the top there from behind. And on the bottom, on the bottom one, you can see a little more clearly, there's a little window that you stick your head behind and look, and you look for a red dot that's in the sky. And if you've aligned the finder with, its, with the telescope tube, wherever you put that red dot, that's where the telescope is in. So very, very simple. You keep both eyes open to use that one. Uh, and it's, it's quite fast uh, to aim it as something that you can see with your eyes. If you need to aim it on something that you can't quite see with your eyes, uh, like a fainter star or anything, then you have to use an optical one on the left. I use a telescope that has both mounted one to get me to an initial starting point quickly, and then I go to the optical finder to get to the left, uh, to get to the target uh, more accurately. The finder is important. Not all telescopes, uh, especially at the lower end of the prices, come with a good one, and that could end up frustrating, uh, frustrating the, the first time or novice user. So when taking a look at a telescope, pay attention to the, what type of finder, it, what type of finder it is, um, and, uh, does it look like it's really tiny or does it look reasonably sized, right? Because if it's too small, it cannot, it's not that usable. So that's a finder. So we can talk about eyepieces. These are the things that determine the magnification and how wide your field of view is. They're interchangeable. Uh, they come in many focal lengths. And there's usually a number printed on the barrel that tells you the, the focal length. Uh, that's measured in millimeters. And they come in three barrel sizes and one and a quarter, one in the middle there, and two inches. One and a quarter is the most popular. They're also coming two inches, and they're still on the market. Still, there's these things called 0.965 inches. Um, those are those are that's a very very old style. 
They're very, not very common, but it's, it is possible to get a telescope that still has those and you want to avoid those because they're usually very, very low quality and will not give you a good view. A good telescope can come with poor eyepieces. Most telescopes that you'll see advertised, uh, that we're going to cover tonight, you're going to find they come with, a, with an okay eyepiece. Not a great eyepiece, an okay one, or it could be a really poor one. And the problem is that if it, a good telescope coming with poor eyepieces really doesn't do the telescope, uh, doesn't do you a lot of service. If you get a good eyepiece, if you just buy an eyepiece or two to use with whatever telescope you do buy, it can make your, it'll make your telescope perform better, almost always. So, and how do you know if they're good or not? Well, price is usually a guide like anything else. Generally speaking, price is the guide. They're also, the good ones are heavier. They're just heavier, they just feel, more, there's more weight and they're not made out of plastic, right? They're made out of metal and glass. So the, high, the, the, hob, the hobby killer eyepiece comes with poor ones. They've either got it like the one on the left, look at the little hole you have to look through in the middle of that uh, eye cup there. It's just a tiny little hole. I don't know how much, uh, it's almost impossible to use. The one in the middle is a little bit better, but it's labeled super. It's not made from a manufacturer that makes eyepieces. Uh, there's the other one, Super 25, the wide angle. That one's probably the best of the three because it's just because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, got a, big, a bigger viewport to look through. But they're generally, they're very lightweight. They have no markings on them. They don't have the name of a manufacturer. These are the ones that you'll find with the hobby killers. So you, you're just better off buying another eyepiece and using that with whatever you do buy because it'll improve it, right? The good ones, are more substantial looking. They have the name of a manufacturer on there. Um, and um, uh, like, like the manufacturer of the uh, telescope you bought, for example, or something else. Um, and they will make your telescope perform better. The PLOSL is a type of eyepiece. They come in all sorts of uh, sizes and configurations and they probably have the best price performance ratio. They're not gonna break the bank trying to buy them. Um, but they will perform better than the stock ones you typically get with uh, the lower uh, lower price telescopes. Now on the higher end, like any hobby, you can spend as much as you want on the hobby, whether it's the telescope or the accessories and eyepieces are no exception. And the high end ones can cost as much as the telescope you just bought. And especially if we're talking in the hundreds of dollars, they can cost that much. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, those high end eyepieces, you will last you the rest of your life. They'll go in, they'll go, generally speaking, they'll work in any telescope you ever buy and they will, as long as you keep them clean and don't drop them, <laughs> they will perform 25 years later, the same as they performed uh, on the day you bought them. And so they are truly a long-term investment uh, for your hobby. Collimation tool is the last accessory. If you're going to buy a reflector, a Newtonian telescope with the mirrors, then you need a collimation tool. It is a necessity with a reflector. If, the tells, if you buy a reflector and it doesn't have one in the box, then you need to buy one. Uh, if it, a, good, a good reflector will come with one of these to allow you to go through a little quick process to align the optics in it. That's called collimation, which you need to do um, every time you use a reflector. There's two kinds. There's an optical one, often referred to as a collimation cap or a Cheshire eyepiece. It's a thing, you, it's a little tool that you stick into the eyepiece and you're looking at views like I'm showing on the bottom left where you are bringing the primary mirror and the secondary mirror and the focuser all into alignment. Uh, because in, in reflector type telescopes, the way the main mirror is mounted in the tube um, isn't super rigid and it can move around a little bit, especially if you are transporting the telescope um, to more than just from your house to your backyard, if you're, especially if you're driving around with it, or if you're going over bumpy roads, or you jostle it, it, it the, the mirror does move a little bit. You do this; you have to do this realignment process, and it's called that's called collimation. And you need a tool to do it, and it can be intimidating to do it at the beginning. We offer clinics on how to do this, and I'll talk about those later in how to use a telescope workshops, but it has to be done because that way you get the best performance out of your reflector and things won't seem blurry um, or fuzzy, right? And so, and once you've done it a few times, it only takes a minute uh, to do it, minute or two, and you're, and you're observing. So that's the kind on the left, optically. There's also a shiny, fancy kind called a laser collimator, which uses a laser 
to do the same thing. And, and you put that in the eyepiece and you turn on the laser and you're looking at red dots from the laser and where they fall on the primary mirror and where they come back, as you can see on the little box back to the, to the laser. They, they work the same in a similar principle. You use, you're letting the laser do the job. They cost more money. Uh, they're pretty fancy. They don't necessarily give you better results than using the Cheshire eyepiece on the left, which is just simply an optical tool where you look through a little peephole and you're using your eye to do the same thing. The laser sounds like it will do a, always do a better job. Not always. Uh, and you don't have to spend the money on that, even though they're not that expensive. The, the, call them the Cheshire eyepiece uh, is, is really inexpensive. And, and if you're a telescope that you bought, the reflector, if it comes with one, great. You need to learn how to use it and use it every time. If it doesn't come with one, then you got to get one. So the characteristics of a hobby killer telescope. This is what you want to look for and avoid, right? If the mount looks like it's wobbly or flimsy or undersized, and that's usually going to be on the equatorial, and you want to stay away. If it comes with a 0.965 inch eyepiece, uh, especially looks up, either either get it thinking that it you know that you'll get another eyepiece or just avoid that telescope altogether, right? If the finder scope is undersized. Uh, or looks or looks super flimsy. Uh, don't get it. If it's a red dot it, as opposed to optical, you'll be fine. If it's an optical, that's where the undersized or invisible ones gets to be a problem, right? If the packaging has claims of high magnification, if the packaging or the advertising of this telescope talks about magnification, then I think you should move on. You don't need to worry about that. If it's a brand not associated with telescopes, there's lots of brands out there. They're not astronomy. Uh, vendors, um, then you, you don't really want to buy it. Everything I'll show you tonight is uh, astronomy vendors. These are the vendors that actually make telescopes, and these are the, the types of brands you're going to want to see. If you don't see one of those, probably best to keep looking. If it's in an outrageous box, um, don't, you know, you need to move on. Because hobby killers can often come in an outrageous box. The Astral Observer on the top left there for $349 on an EQ hobby killer mount, advertising 675 power maximum magnification by a company called Fotar, right? That is probably not a very good telescope. And the Hokie 675 EQ, also claiming 675 power and suggesting that you can see the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, or you can see Pluto or the Whirlpool Galaxy or colors in the Ring Nebula there. Those, and the Horsehead Nebula, especially up there, just to the right of the word power. If it says you can do that or it suggests that you can see those things that well, that is a hobby killer. And that is, <laughs> and it says, and if it says STEM on the package, it must be good, right? Because it's for science, technology, and engineering and mathematics, right? So you don't, you want to avoid those things. Good telescopes are generally shipped or sold in boxes that look like that. There's the brand name. And inside you will find a pretty decent telescope. They're pretty plain. The packaging is not, you, want, you don't wanna be swayed by the packaging. So what to look for, we're gonna, we're gonna say that, don't look, if it's smaller than three inches or 76 to 80 millimeters in diameter, don't buy it. It's just too small for anything. Uh, sure, you could do the moon, but after that, you really don't have any, you really, you know, you, at the low end, three inches or, or more. Uh, Look for, look for the largest the aperture that you can find practical, right? Um, based on the size, the weight, uh, those kinds of things. Try to get the biggest one that you find practical, given that what you think you can handle or what the person you think you're going to give it to you as a gift or could handle for size and weight, those kinds of things, right? Look for that sturdy mount. Make sure you got one and a quarter inch eye pieces, right? Want a good finder. Get it from a reputable manufacturer. And generally, we want a telescope that will work, that will work for you one that you'll want to take out of the closet and use. Because if it's sitting in the closet, it's even if you spend a lot of money and it's a good one, if it's sitting in the closet, because it's just too big to set up, that's not a good telescope either because you can't use it. So the things to consider in that regard are, where are you going to use it? Are you gonna use it in your backyard or on your balcony inside the city? And you're not really gonna, you don't really see yourself using it anywhere else or, or are you gonna need to transport it uh, out to a dark site or out to the country? Or you might have a place or you will visit some relatives that live in darker skies. You're going to be able to transfer, right? Where are you going to use it? 
where are you going to store this thing? You know, if it's, uh, where are you going to put it? Is it going to live in a closet? Uh, where, where are you going to store it? So size uh, can affect things. A garage where vehicles are going in and out uh, with exhaust fumes is not a good place to store a telescope, right? If, it, and if you want to store it in an unheated garage and cars are going in and out, with fumes and things like that, that'll be okay. But then you should store it in something that's gonna keep the fumes off of the uh, telescope because dust and fumes are not good for optics. Um, but where are you gonna store it, right? How old are you? How strong are you? Can, you? can you handle the size and shape of this telescope? Do you want to try astrophotography? I don't, I'm not emphasizing this on, uh, on this particular uh, tutorial, but if you want to try it, uh, there, there are some telescopes that are better suited for that if you want to try your hand at that. And also set your, you know, how much money you're willing to spend. Set yourself a budget uh, and you're going to see the type of budget ranges next uh, that you need to set uh, for, uh, for, for this. So th those are the things to consider. Just kind of give some thought to who's going to use it and where and where they're going to store it. How are you going to transport it? Those kinds of things. So we're going to start with the, with the, tar with the starter telescope. Right, uh, and these are and this is going to be manual. These are ones that are manual. You have to you have to move them yourself to point them and move them. So we're talking for beginners, especially children, casual users. And the benefits here are that they're inexpensive and there's almost no learning curve. You don't have to spend too much. So the Celestron first scope um, is uh, in the 76 millimeter range, available at most locations, uh, many places. And for under hundred dollars, you get something that is actually quite usable, even though it is quite a small size, right? For two hundred fifty dollars, Orion sells something called an Orion Star Blast. Similar, sits on a tabletop, um, and um, uh, and you can use it, uh, and it, and uh, it's very very easy to use, lightweight and small. This is what they look like, right? So first scope on the left, and the Star Blast on the right. The uh, if you notice. It doesn't have the two, the two vertical side pieces, only one of them, but it is really a Dobsonian mount. These are both reflectors and the type of mount that they're on is a little Dobsonian. They don't, they don't go on tripods, they go on tables. So you need a sturdy type table or, or something to put it on where you can, uh, you can use, but they're very easy to, to move uh, in and out of the house and they're easy for a child to use and they're really easy to aim and they get you started at being able to first find, find things and see them well, especially the brighter objects like the moon and the planets and the brighter stars and, and a few of the brighter clusters, those kinds of things. So it is just a starter, not a lot of money to spend. It won't, uh, it won't uh, frustrate. Um, and if you do decide that you wanna spend more, well, you haven't spent everything on the first one you bought. You, can, you still have money to, to buy another scope. And these are good starters. If you don't want a manual and you want it to track, as a starter telescope, as a beginner, with a low learning curve, so that the objects do stay in view without having to push them around, you, you know you can still get them kind of small, but they do go up in price as soon as you as soon as you get a track, it adds to the budget. It's hard to get out, it's hard to get into that first price point. So Skywatcher makes something called a Virtuoso at 90 millimeters, and and Celestron makes a refractor at 102 millimeters. At, so we got it at four to six hundred dollar price range, right? So this is what they look like. All right, so on the left, you've got the Virtuoso. Again, a little tabletop mounted guy, but it is a turn on and instant tracking. As long as you've put in the latitude uh, beforehand, or you've at least uh, pointed it to Polaris to start, as soon as you turn on, put in the bat, as soon as you turn on the switch, it is tracking uh, and it's quite versatile because you can also take that telescope off and plop a camera on there. Um, uh, one thing I'll say. The only problem is right now I didn't uh, is that I couldn't find it for it's advertised, but it's not available anywhere. So it's kind of too bad that the supply. So this is where I'm going to start talking to differentiation about supply chain issues or not. That one on the left, unfortunately, is not is if you can find it, it's a good little starter. Um, very versatile, not very expensive, and the instant tracking is a good feature once you've done that one step. And if you don't ever change your latitude too much, so if you're observing in the Edmonton area. Uh, you only have to set that once. And so after that, it's just turn it on and go. The Celestron next star on the right is a little refractor on a tracking computerized mount, right? So there it's a slightly more learning curve. You got to turn it on. You got to do an align, which is pretty quick. 
and then it tracks. And it also has the go-to, so you can dial in an object. The one on the left doesn't do that, uh, but it's also a little bit less expensive and quite a bit smaller. Uh, and the telescope is a compound on the one on the left, 90 millimeter compound telescope. That's actually quite versatile uh, uh, for uh, even for trying out some simple astrophotography. So on the starter end, a couple of tracking telescopes. Now, back in 2020, uh, in the November, December issue of Sky News Magazine, which is Canada's astronomy magazine, uh, now owned by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, there was a review of a, tr of a trio of telescopes for beginners at the $300 uh, price point. And you can see them listed there, 80 to uh, 90 millimeter in size, uh, all alt azimuth mounts, so all, ma all manual, no tracking, no go-to, just manual mounts, all refractors. And these were judged to be good buys uh, a year ago in Sky News Magazine. So a year later, what do we find? Well, you cannot, can't seem to buy that Explorer Scientific anywhere because it's backordered everywhere and nobody knows when they're coming in. The Mead, in the, the one in the middle by Mead, the Star Pro 90, no longer made. So can't buy it. The Orion, the one on the right, is available and is in stock. Uh, and so that particular set of three starter telescopes, that's the one uh, that is available right now. So this slide wasn't, it was kind of out of date. So I made a little update. I just said, okay, I found another one, the Skywatcher Star Traveler 102, 102 millimeter. Okay, so it doesn't hit the $300 price point. But I've, I think in my opinion, that one is in the same category as a good starter refractor, a little bit more expensive and is in stock uh, at All Star Telescope. I will talk a little bit more about these vendors uh, later in the tutorial. So, so that's, that's what, how the landscape changed uh, from a year ago on the, on the trio of starters. Uh, the next thing is a, is a, was new last year. Celestron introduced a new line of telescopes called StarSense Explorer, trying to make the entry into astronomy for beginners even easier and these are tracking tel these are telescopes that allow you to find things easily. They don't track, but they find things easily for you. And instead of putting the smarts into the telescope, what they, what they did is they said, no, oh, everybody's got a smartphone. Use your smartphone in combination with this telescope to set up and track. And so I'm gonna show you a short video here uh, that shows you the features of this series of uh, telescopes. Ready for a new kind of telescope experience? Unlock the power of your smartphone to help you navigate the night sky. Introducing StarSense Explorer by Celestron. It's fast, easy, and accurate. In minutes, you're ready to take a guided tour of the universe. First, dock your smartphone and launch the StarSense Explorer app. Unlike other astronomy apps, StarSense Explorer aligns precisely with your telescope and uses sky recognition technology to pinpoint its exact position in the night sky. Follow the simple instructions, and in seconds, the app generates a list of all the best objects currently visible in the night sky. Select an object from the list and follow the on-screen arrows to the desired object. As you move the telescope, StarSense Explorer recalibrates its position in real time. The bullseye turns green when your object is ready to view in the eyepiece. It's that simple. StarSense Explorer works anywhere in the world, no cell signal required. So whether you're in your backyard or a remote dark sky location, the universe is yours to explore. So that is a series of Star Sense Explorers that came out in 2020. And these were also reviewed in Sky News Magazine in May, June of 2020. And they were determined to be a good telescope um, uh, uh, to get started with. And they come in various uh, price points. If you want to start with the 80 millimeter version, 80, mill 80 millimeter refractor version, uh, it's basically seemingly back ordered uh, everywhere. I think it may be available on Amazon, but you gotta watch because that's probably a, a reseller of some kind and it may be an inflated price. 
So you can't really get, see that one anywhere. But the other ones at similar price point, the one on the right, the 114 millimeter reflector is in stock uh, right now at All Star Telescope as one example. And the one in the middle, uh, which is a bigger refractor, uh, higher price point, also in stock, the 102 millimeter um, refractor. So this is a combination where you use your phone in order to do the alignment process, and then you push your telescope as directed by the phone to your targets, and then you follow it along manually. So it's a, it's a different way to get started, and it uses a phone, which may have some appeal to the younger astronomer that uh, is used to doing things with phones for upping the coolness factor, or just that it's an interesting way uh, to do uh, to uh, to use a telescope. One thing I'll say is that phone life will be shorter in the colder weather when you're running this app, because it's gotta be on all the time to find things, right? The other thing is you notice in the video, the screen was in, was normally, the screen was normally lit on the tele, on the on the phone on the scope, and if you're out at a dark area and your eyes are dark adapted, you that that screen would be far too bright. So what you need to do is either use the app's night mode, or you need to dim the phone or cover it with red plastic or something because it's it's way too bright. That's this that's a minor thing that uh, can be can be rectified. But you got to remember if you wanted to go with that is make sure that your phone can be covered. The other thing I'll say also is that that adapter that docking station that they showed where you mount your telephone. It turns out you can also buy that docking station um, separately. Uh, and, uh, oh, all right. You have to buy, you can buy that docking station separately and mount it on an existing telescope if you want to use that kind of technology. So that's, uh, and, uh, and the key is, is that if you buy that docking station, that's what unlocks the code to be able to use the StarSense Explorer app. You don't, the app is free to download, but you can't use it unless you bought one of these scopes or at least the docking station uh, for it so that uh, you're paying the license fee uh, for the, uh, the StarSense Explorer. Okay, oh good, somebody's handling the chat. Thank you very much. All right, let me get back into this uh, slide here. All right, so that was the StarSense Explorer series. Now we'll look at Dobsonian telescopes, the reflectors on Dobsonian mounts. So these are generally for visual astronomers, smooth and stable motions, good for planets and deep sky observing. So there's a range of prices at the six to 10 inch uh, diameter mirrors from 450 to about a thousand dollars. The main vendors in this space um, and these price points is Skywatcher and Orion. And as I switch to the color scheme, it is tough to buy that Skywatcher right now. These are seem back ordered seemingly everywhere. So that's too bad. Uh, the, it's, I, I have not been able to find any site um, that, that allows you to buy anything in the six to 10 inch range, which is the most popular ranges. But the one in green, Orion, turns out those are in stock. So the equivalents uh, in Orion are in stock at the six, eight and 10 inch levels. Uh, I will note that Orion and Skywatcher telescopes, they're both Chinese manufacturer and they come out of the same factory. They are different, slightly different configurations, optics, motors, um, all those, uh, those things, they're all the same. It's just two different lines. But for some reason in Orion, they're available and they're available now. So this is what we're talking about, right? The Orion on the left, Skywatcher on the right. We've seen those before when we talked about mounts. I'll also note that in the, on the Orion side, it's only the solid tube ones. They also have the retractable tube style, like the one on the right, but those are sold out or back ordered uh, as well. So the solid tube ones are the only ones you can get right about now. Alta Azimuth mounted computerized telescope is the next category. So these are the ones that are motorized and computer controlled. Uh, they work on the Alta mount. And they're good for visual, they're good for planetary and lunar, so master photography. Their benefits are this, they, they, do, they do the tracking uh, and then there is the go-to function for being able to find things. And they come at similar price points, as low as $700 or so for the four inch, all the way up to $1,600 for an eight inch version. Celestron is the major player in this uh, space. Mead is also a player in this space. 
uh, right? And if we look, if we take a look, there are some access uh, availability issues there. The uh, the Mead can't get it in, can't get it. And for some reason, you can get the four and the five inch and the six inch and the eight inch, but not in the uh, but but not the Celest uh, not the Celestron five inch for some reason. That particular size seems to be not available everywhere, but it, anywhere. Uh, but the other ones are in stock at All Star and Orion. So there's a difference there. This, what do they look like? Well, there's, some, there's a couple of classics, right? There's a six inch version on the left uh, and then a five inch version uh, on the right by Mead. I'll, I'll make a note that, uh, let's go back a slide, is that um, Mead uh, filed for bankruptcy due to a class action suit uh, a couple of years ago. And last year, in, in this past year, uh, the, the leader of that class action suit, was, was, which was Orion Telescope in the United States, uh, they were able, they actually acquired all the assets, intellectual property and names and patents, everything from me. So when you, if you are looking at Mead products, you actually go to the Orion website and there's a Mead tab in that. So they're the exclusive dealer and Mead is no longer sold by dealers anywhere else. Uh, Orion sells the whole Orion line and the entire Mead line now as a result of that uh, class action suit. So, there they are, the Altaz computerized telescopes. Another category is the equatorially mounted tel computerized telescope. And at this point, you should be wondering why am I showing you this slide? Isn't that a hobby killer? Didn't you tell me that that type of mounts a hobby killer? Well, it is, except that if you really are serious about astrophotography and you are patient and can pay attention to details and you wish to climb a steep learning curve, you really want to climb that steep learning curve and you want to buy a good solid EQ mount, then go for it. It won't be a hobby killer. I just wanted to steer people away from that first telescope right, uh, that didn't meet those criteria. And they come in a lot of price points. They don't, they don't, the low end isn't even listed here because it's very difficult uh, to get a good one at the low end and to, uh, at under at under $500 or even at $500, you got to buy that star adventure at the top of the list. You still got to supply your own, uh, your own tripod for it. They all need a camera, but you still have to bring your own tripod with that thing. And then you can see the price points for the, for decent ones, uh, top out and look at that. You know, you can get most of them right now, except for that Celestron eight, uh, compound telescope that doesn't seem to be available anywhere, at least with that type of optic edge HD. The other ones are available, but, but that's not really the kind of thing um, I wanted to talk about. Revised, I, if you really do want to get into, uh, into um, oh, these are some examples. Sorry, these are some examples of on the $600 price point, the $1,500 price point that are available right now um, at All Star uh, for uh, so put your own scope on it or camera or else comes with the scope and you just attach a camera. But if you really want to get started in astrophotography in a simple way, and with it more or less a starter telescope of the kind I've been talking about this evening, something that's inexpensive and only a gentle learning curve, here's a recommendation, the Celestron Nexstar 4SE at $700. It actually retails for $690 right now. So for $700, you get a package that is the design from the beginning to be both visual and simple way to attach the camera so that you can do astrophotography, right? So there it is. There's some pictures of it, uh, on, uh, of how you use it. It's good for visual, good for photography. It's motorized for tracking. It's got the full go-to. It's a small package. It's lightweight. It's quite simple to set up in a line. Tracks both Altas or equatorially. You can see you can you can flip uh, you can you can put it equatorial if you need it. You need to, and you can attach a camera to that telescope, or you can just remove that telescope and attach your own camera with a, with a plate uh, if you want to go with uh, if you want to go with a wider field, for example. Right? It's all in a pretty simple package, and it's only seven hundred dollars. And I would recommend it as a good visual scope to get started anyway. Uh, if, if, that's, if, if that fits within your budget at $700. And another good thing is that you can buy it locally. So that's a good way to get started on that. And there's another way to think about getting into astrophotography in a simple way, and is, uh, which is why not use your smartphone? Why not use your phone? Modern phones these days have pretty incredible cameras on them with, with uh, some very good apps available for astrophotography. Most people have a phone and it's a pretty gentle learning curve 
uh, in order to be able to do it, right? And so what you really need though, is a mount or a docking station, something to attach, clamp on that phone onto your telescope instead of just holding it by hand. 60 bucks gets you into doing that with whatever telescope you decide to buy to get started. And what can you do? Oh, sorry, this is the attachments. I'm sorry, this is the attachments. So the Orion has a, something called the SteadyPix Pro, which is in stock and it has, uh, you can see it mounted there on the left on the back end of a refractor. Uh, and then Celestron sells uh, an adapter also uh, that you could put and you can see it up there on the back end of a, of a Schmidt of a compound telescope, right? So they allow you to, to clamp on a phone's camera right where the eyepiece would be. Uh, in order to take uh, in order to take pictures, um, and they, these two work very very well. And what can you do? What kind of astrophotography can you do? Well, you can point it at the moon, and here's some shots through a eight inch telescope on the left, or an eighty millimeter refractor in the middle, or a, or a bigger refractor uh, on the right. And you can see different phones are used: iPhone eight, a Samsung Galaxy, and even a BlackBerry. Right. You, and these are, in fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, all three of these, the people that did them, that are listed there, uh, they actually just held the phone by hand. I, 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 I've tried it myself, and I can't hold the phone steady enough usually to do it, so I don't think I could do this. That's why I recommend the adapter. You can do this, or you can do this, courtesy of Andrew Symes, an iPhone 6 on a Celestron 8. You can get that shot of, ja of the planets. Saturn on the left, Mars on the right. Want to go deep sky? You can do this with a 10 inch reflector on the Whirlpool Galaxy on the left, or a 100 millimeter refractor, the Orion Nebula, or the Horsehead Nebula on the right. These were taken with a Huawei P20 uh, Pro phone. So this is courtesy of, um, of a Facebook group called Smartphone Astrophotography that I asked permission to show. So you can do a lot. With a phone that you already you probably you may even already own uh, into into astrophotography, and that's as much as I'm going to say about astrophotography in this one. So we're going to get into uh, taking a look at uh, where to buy. But before I do that, I wanted to talk about RASC Edmonton's Telescope Loaner Program. You can try telescopes before you buy them, and you if you go to the website of EdmontonRASC.com and click on Loaners, there you'll see. Uh, how to contact the loaner program coordinator. And there's the list of the different types of telescopes that are borrowable. If you're a member, it doesn't cost anything to borrow a telescope for a month. If you're not a member, you put down a $40 refundable deposit and you get a telescope to try out for a month. And they range from 90 millimeter, about three inches or so, all the way up to a 10 inch. Uh, there is a Nexstar 8 in there. There is a uh, 6SE, which is uh, computerized tracking. Um, there's even a, uh, a, a mount at the bottom if you wanna just do your own equatorial, try out an EQ, a fairly good EQ mount for, for photography. Uh, so there's, there's all sorts of telescopes you can try, try out before you buy anything. I understand there's a bit of a waiting list at the moment. Uh, this program's in fairly high demand, uh, but it is there and doesn't really cost you anything before you make a decision. If you wanna try that route. So where to buy? I'm gonna look at a few uh, places about where to buy, and I start with local. Uh, here in Alberta, we have a longtime vendor called All Star Telescope. And up until this past month, it was located in uh, Didsbury, Alberta, but uh, Bev and Ken, who ran it uh, since uh, about 15 years ago, they decided to retire. They sold the business. It's under new ownership. Uh, physically, it's going to be moving to Edmonton, although online sales, there's no change right now. Uh, and curbside pickup, I think, has now switched to the Edmonton location, um, but it's under new ownership under the person pictured there in the middle, Nicholas, uh, I forget his last name now, the guy's name Nicholas. So it's still an Alberta-based uh, business, and hopefully the tradition of uh, excellent customer service uh, does continue, and they've always been very price competitive. So that's Altar Telescope. Further afield in Canada, you've got some vendors in Ontario and in Quebec that are still going. Uh, and, uh, and to my knowledge, uh, have good uh, customer service. You can talk to people that are knowledgeable, just like at All Star, 
uh, I'm hoping at All-Star with the new owner, but just like it was at All-Star, you can talk to people that uh, know about telescopes and they're not, they, 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 they are not clueless. They know about telescopes. And if you want to buy Orion or Mead, you have to go to uh, the Orion website and it's it, telescope.com. That's the only place to buy those particular uh, brands uh, of telescopes. If you're looking in the used, uh, if you want to buy used, and there's a fairly vigorous uh, marketplace for those types uh, for telescopes as well, there's some places. So there's Astro Buy Sell, astrobuycell.com. This is a Canadian astronomy buy and sell website uh, run in Canada by Canadians. And um, you have to have an account uh, in order to post ads and things like that. But it is a good place uh, where generally what you find is people are selling things, they know what they're selling. And, uh, and things are, it's, a, it's a good marketplace for that. There's a Facebook group also um, called Canadian Telescope Astronomy Buy and Sell that also is a fairly good uh, community of uh, people that are into the hobby and is for buying and selling e equipment. Then on the web, of course, there's lots of online uh, retailers like Amazon, Best Buy, Costco, Leather Drugs, Walmart. You can search for telescopes on any of their websites and stuff will come up and we're going to take a look at some of that. But you got to watch at least at Best Buy and Walmart. Those online marketplaces include uh, third party sellers. And so even though it's at the Best Buy or Walmart website, you're really buying from a third party and you got to watch for that. It doesn't just because you found it at the Best Buy website doesn't mean it's Best Buy selling it to you. It can mean that, but you need to turn that little filter off so that you only see stuff from the vendors. I would not recommend the third party marketplace sellers. You can also search Kijiji and in the hobbies in crafts uh, area is where you find, generally find the telescopes uh, for astronomy. In other areas, you'll find things that telescope, but they're generally for construction or, or other things and they're not, they're not for astronomy. So you, the best place I've found is that you have to be in the hobbies and crafts area doing that and in all cases uh, you got to be aware of hobby killers especially on the uh, online marketplaces like at uh, Best Buy uh, Amazon Amazon is by definition always third parties right so well almost always and so you got to watch for the hobby killers because they do exist on all of those online retailers so I'm going to I wanted to review some websites uh, just to like just to see what's what and I'll offer a few comments about what we see uh, on these websites. So I need to switch screens here to my browser. And so here we are at uh, the All-Star Telescope website. There is that first scope. It wasn't at the $60 price point. This is the Signature Series Moon Edition. So it's a little bit more expensive, but it happens to be in stock and you could, uh, you could buy that little first scope there. Um, other places sell it, but I'd rather, uh, I'd rather support a local, uh, I have to just change my screen size a little bit. One second. And, um, I'd rather support somebody local than, than uh, buying further afield if possible, but that's generally available everywhere. There's one of the star sense explorers, um, uh, at $250, uh, from Celestron which uses your phone, that's in stock, a new refractor version. Here's that other one at 410, the 102 refractor on a, on a manual mount. And uh, there's that Nexstar SC. Well, there's a whole, that's a whole series of telescopes. There's that four inch version at 90, 690, which is designed out of the box to be able to uh, attach or, or put a camera on there. Uh, the five, is out of stock and can find that anywhere. There's the six, the six SE and the eight and the eight SE, those bigger, those bigger ones are available at Celestra, at All-Star Telescope. If uh, you go to their homepage here, you can see they, they announced that it's moving to Edmonton, although that's happened. But website, email, phone number, all the same if you wanted to uh, do it. And you can see that the curbside pickup is available now, but now it's down in 
32 Ave and Parsons Road. So it's down in that southeast uh, uh, sort of semi-industrial, in the southern part of the semi-industrial area uh, of Edmonton. So that's where you go for All-Star Telescope. Orion, uh, there's the Orion website. And you can see, uh, you can see across the top of them, there's a Mead tab, there's a Coronado for solar scopes. They, they, they own all of that now. So that's the vendor for those product lines. But um, for the Dobsonians though, um, there's that SkyQuest uh, eight inch classic Dobsonian, Dobsonian in a very nice red tube, right? So that's, that's a classic starter telescope, easy to use, will let, will let you see a lot of targets um, and not very expensive to get started, but you gotta go to Orion. The shipping to Canada is not a problem with them. If you see the check mark, not all vendors are this clear, I found about what's in stock or not. These guys are very good. If you see that green check mark, uh, a couple of days ago, one of their agents told me, if you see that green check mark, we definitely have it. And so they can ship it. So you go to Best Buy and you search for uh, telescopes, you're going to get something that looks like this. And you get this thing of top selling products, which you scroll right past to get started. And then you get to the results and you see the little thing here, Best Buy only is turned off, right? Uh, because down here at the bottom is this, uh, uh, where is it here? Uh, no, oh, things, I uh, got to confuse it. They were, there was something at the bottom, which ended up being, was vastly over, oh, maybe it's this one here. Yeah, I think it's this one. Next star 130, it's $715. I believe that is overpriced. So what you do is if you're at Best Buy, you click Best Buy only, that's what I would do. Now there's a lot less results. And these are sh sold and shipped by Best Buy, which means the return policy is better than from any third party. And uh, you can go, I think you can go back to the store and do the return rather than paying shipping. And so they do have them. They have some of the ones like the Star Sense Explorer, uh, and they are in stock and they go up from there. I also noticed today that uh, the Black Friday sales have already started, uh, even though that's more than a week away. Uh, so they do, they do carry it. Celestron is a brand that's carried in many, many places. Uh, All Star also has it, but you can, if some, it, they may not always have what you're looking for. If you go to Amazon and you, .ca and you search for telescope, Okay, you're gonna get a lot of you're gonna get a lot of things. So first, what you do get is things that either have you get spotting scopes mixed into the bag, hard, right? And over here on the brands, look at the names. You can see on the names of the brands. So far, there's just the one that I recognize. So I could just filter it. Just show me Celestrons, uh, but I just wanted to show you that there are things on here that I suggest you don't want to buy. Some, a telescope for astronomy beginners, kids, adults, right? Uh, and it's by Luxum or whatever. I'm not even going to open it, but, or an upgraded telescope. That's the brand, upgraded telescope, right? You, you know, you've got this Quincy advertising with the magnification is the thing, right? 60 millimeters. See, the, the 500 millimeters, what's that? Well, that's just the focal length. Of length of basically the length of the tube. 60 is the diameter of this lens. Not something you want to buy. Uh, then there's a telescope for kids, adults, astronomy, beginners. Advertising the advertising the um, magnification. You can even take pictures of Jupiter with your phone. Um, it's $90. I don't know. And so on. There's lots of things. Here's one that you use on your deck, on the floor of your deck for $40 by Cihea. Uh, Celestrons. You're generally going to find Celestrons or something else, and you generally want to avoid the something else on Amazon. You go to Costco. Every once in a while, Costco will bring in a pretty decent tar starter telescope. I bought my first go-to many years ago there from because uh, they, ha they happen to have a an overstock on a, on a Celestron and it turned out and it was very inexpensive. So um, there's a mixture of things, spotting scopes, binoculars, opera, you know, Bushnell opera viewers and things, but there is the, so there is the hobby killer style package. You can avoid that, but they do also have 
Um, oh, they have another hobby killer here. They have one that goes in the backpack. There's not a lot at this particular time. There's not a lot to choose from. There's a hundred millimeter at 314 there, this package here, probably the best one of the lot at Costco. Every once in a while though, as you, if, you've, if you've ever shopped at Costco, you know they sometimes bring in something for a few weeks and then when they're gone, they're gone and never come back. And every once in a while, it could be a good thing. London Drugs also has the same things. There's that first scope at $80, the signature edition with the moon. You can also buy a telescopic mascara there and other things. So you, you kind of have to scroll to find things, but there's a Celestron 5 right there uh, at 940, spotting scopes, uh, things like that. Um, so again, generally speaking, it's Celestron. If you if you if if All Star has it, I'd probably suggest going there. But if they don't have it, there are online retailers all over the place that sell Celestron. And here's Walmart, same kind of thing. You get a whole grab bag of things. You need to um, I forget where the oh yeah, there's the checkbox there. You got to click that sold and shipped by Walmart to at least be able to say I'm not happy. I bring it back, get my money back, but. There, unfortunately, though, it's some hobby killer EQs on there. But there's that four scope, the non signature at $63 if you wanted to go that route. Uh, the 70 AZ, right? Uh, those kind. I don't know about this uh, backboard. Tell us, uh, I guess it's a telescoping height for the. Don't buy that one. That was not going to show you the moon too, uh, things too much. So those online vendors are have lots and lots of things. But generally, the feature brand is Celestron. Astro Buy Sell, if you want to go used, Astro Buy Sell is the Canadian um, marketplace. And what you do is uh, you can browse the ads. And what I've done is I've done a browse where I picked telescopes, because you can, you can all do buy pieces and other things, but just list telescopes, active sales in Alberta, right? In Alberta as my search radius. And there's a few listings. So you range all over the place. So here's a, there's a there's a Dobsonian six inch F11 at four hundred dollars sold in Calgary. So if we click that and we look at it, we go, what do we see? Okay, so this looks really long tube, right? Really, really long tube. Um, and so this is an older one. Not sure about how smooth the movements are. Um, it's only four hundred dollars, but it's a really long tube, so it's not very it's, uh, you can get shorter, shorter versions in this, $400. You can talk to this person to find out what it is, right? So don't know what to say about that one too much, but the, here's a Mead, uh, 102 millimeter F78 refractor, $150 right here in Edmonton. What does it look like? Is there a picture? Well, this picture shows us what? Just a tube upside down, don't know. Not a lot of information, hard to say. It's just a tube, so you can't even use it really. You're not going to use it like a like a sailor might on a boat. So here's a eight inch SCT with the high with the higher end coatings, right? And legs with wedge. Very rare compass leveler in Calgary, five hundred dollars. Eight inch compound telescope with the ultra transmission coatings. Hmm, seems like a pretty low price. Would it, so what does it look like? Well, here's the picture supply. Well, there it is. There's the OTA. There's the skeletal. There's the finder, optical finder. Got the diagonal. It's got the fork mount. It's got this. There's the wedge for tracking and setting your alignment. Here's another photo sideways, but it looks like it's got the heavy-duty tripod and all that. So it seems, I don't know how old, I guess I'd have to find out how old is this telescope. At $500, it's quite a good price. Um, probably want to find, probably need to do some uh, talk to this person um, and find out, dig a little deeper into that one. Uh, and so there is a Celestron 90 at 1,000, a Skywatcher 200 at 650 in Sherwood Park, right? And there's a Celestron C8. So these are all the listings uh, within Alberta, a lot of them, or a lot of them, you could drive to do the pickup. And generally speaking, uh, this is a good marketplace. There is the the help. You if you've never used this site before and you want to use it, 
click here to inform yourself about the latest fraud attempts. This is a good little primer on how to buy and sell safely and confidently on marketplaces. So if you've never used it before, I'd use it. I'd use that. Read that first and then proceed. Here's that Facebook group I was telling you about for Canadian astronomy buy and sell that you, you need to join it to participate it, but you can uh, pretty easily. It's about 2,600 members uh, on there. It's pretty active. It's across Canada. So you got, and I don't know if there's a way to filter local ads only. I haven't, I've only used it a little bit, uh, but you get down there and there's all sorts of things. So cameras and here's a, here's a um, telescope, a compound, right? Uh, what is it? So usually at the bottom of the ad is where you see the price, where they are located, the seller and exactly what it is. So that's an 11 inch um, compound at, uh, and so that's a, a pretty, but it looks like it's in really good condition. Here's a little guy, four inch SE. Unfortunately though, it's only the telescope. So you'd need to mount it. It doesn't come with that, with that mount that I talked about earlier. Uh, and that one's uh, 250 bucks, but it's Mississauga. So you'd have to, you need to do some researching through this one to see if, it, if it's going to be uh, within the province or if you're willing to consider a shipping, you know, all sorts of markets. But generally speaking, the ads are by astronomers. Uh, and they're pretty good ads. Um, sometimes there's the odd ad for somebody that acquired something through an estate sale or things or an estate or things like that. And they don't really know what they have and they're just throwing it up there. But generally speaking, the sellers are, are, are in the hobby and they know, uh, and they know things. So it's a pretty good marketplace for looking for used. Kijiji is the, is another kind of a, could be everything. You need to be in the hobbies and crafts area. So I did a search this evening for, what's available in the Edmonton uh, area, which includes St. Albert and Strathcona County. So there's some ads. And you always get the featured ads, which you can just skip past and just go to see. Okay, so here's a 70, looks like the Astromaster 70 for 180. Can you tell by the picture what it is? Is he got the tripod? So it's got the, so it's got the tripod. Ah, it's a, okay, it's an EQ mount. So I'm going to say, you know, don't, don't bother with that one. Let's go back to where we were. So there's an eight inch Dobsonian. Doesn't look like a modern one, but it could be good. Um, eight inch is a good size. Here's the, uh, looks like a flimsy. This is a flimsy little thing at $50. It's got these MHI pieces. I would move on. Here's a Bushnell. Bushnell used to be known for good things. Not anymore. $50, it's in, yeah, move on. Bushnell for parts, $30, move on. Uh, an astronomical telescope with 30 to 60 power, 50 millimeter, that's too small, move on. There's a Tasco Luminova. Tasco used to be a big, big name for starter telescopes, but uh, not anymore, $60. The only one that even comes close is this, at the moment, uh, is this Celestron 114, might, might not to be too bad. It uh, looks like it's on an okay mount. Edmund, 20, you know, no. Bushnell Deep, 60, no. Uh, here's one where the parts are lying on a bed at 100. Needs gone ASAP, so maybe, uh, you know, I doubt it. Uh, Celestron Power Seeker, it looks okay. I believe this one is not on the right kind of mount. So we look at the picture, yeah, equatorial, that's going to be wobbly. So, we are, uh, every once in a while though, on Kijiji, uh, uh, some, something, something good comes up. Uh, more often than not though, hey, there's a first scope. So at $35, you get the used first scope instead of brand new at 60. So that is a little tour of the marketplace, places where we were. Okay, so back in the, uh, all right. So I wanna talk a little bit about when to buy. I would say if you're thinking about buying, buy now or very soon to avoid disappointment, especially if you're trying to get it for a gift. There are back order timelines from some of the vendors and into 2023 on a lot of things. A lot of the ones that were in red in my slides, I don't think they're not, we're not gonna see them for all of next year. 
Uh, and if there's something in stock now, it may be that they only have one or two. It's hard to tell what the stock numbers are. So if you are interested in something, especially for the Christmas period, do it now. No, I wouldn't wait because, um, and with, uh, and in some places, and in some places, especially the online retailers like the big box stores, the return policy is already extended. Where if you even if you bought it now, you get, you can you get the advantage of the, the Boxing Week uh, all the way to past Boxing Week in order to get. Uh, uh, returns if it turns out to be that way so do it soon and <clears throat> if you do get a new telescope and you need and you need help on how to use it well on january the 19th in a couple of months we will have our annual how to use a telescope workshop where we will help you one-on-one -on -one in how to use this telescope uh, that you have and we used to do it in person we're still going to do it via zoom this january we've done this twice before in the past year via Zoom. So we use Zoom breakout rooms, it works very effectively, where you, each person that attends is paired up with an expert astronomer and they can help them. And a lot of people have gotten very good help via Zoom on being able to use uh, their telescope. So that's coming up next January. And now I will open it up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and if, I know there's been some traffic on the chat. And if there are questions, I will uh, be happy to take them now. I don't have any questions, but that was very good. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Is there Lindor chocolate with this festive special? <laughs> Was that on one of the scopes that we saw on the websites? I just, uh, you know, when you said festive special, I just thought, oh, Lindor chocolate and uh, oh, yeah. rotisserie chicken. Yeah. And if, if the telescope does come with a box of chocolates, it's probably not one you want to buy. Okay. Speaking of festive stuff, uh, do not... Um, when you go, um, you think, oh, to the Gemini meteor shower or the eclipse coming up Thursday night, um, I'm, I'm going to take my thermos and uh, add in a lot of Baileys in there. Uh, highly not recommended because alcohol um, opens the pores. It's great if you're in front of a fireplace to receive the heat, but if your open pores are receiving cold air, it just goes to your core. I'm speaking from personal experience. Uh, don't do that. It was the coldest day of my life, but it was only minus 10. Right. Hey, you're welcome, Steve. Oh, and uh, one other thing uh, regarding uh, something like All Star, um, as a personal philosophy thing, I try as best as I can, um, give my business to local, as in Alberta, Canada, retailers before going out. Uh, and a big reason for that is um, they also support the local astronomy community. Uh, but the, the really big reason is if there's something wrong with your scope, they'll, the customer service at Canadian retailers is, hey, you bought it from me, I'll take it back, I'll give you a replacement and I'll deal with the, the company. Uh, so uh, it, just that level of customer service is well worth, in my opinion, the few extra dollars. And it's not even, um, and, it's, and it's not always even extra dollars. Uh, All Star as a case in point, it's very competitive, the pricing. Um, Oh, I have uh, I have found it to be about the same as anybody else. And even on just making the purchase in the first place, they'll straight up give you the the honest advice. Because uh, they'll ask if you tell them what you what you're thinking about using it for, you will you will get steered to the right one. I mean, that was the case. But uh, I mean, is a slight anomaly with All Star is that it just sold, and I don't know anything about the new owner. Bevan can do uh, recommend the owner uh, and they're on their farewell post. They have a newsletter and on their farewell posting, they said that they think this will work out very, very well for the Alberta 
astronomical community. So I trust him on that. So, but I, and so I, I think it'll be okay. Can I ask you to speak at all on binoculars? Yes, uh, the conventional, well, quite often we, uh, one piece of advice that's often made is that if you're thinking about getting started in astronomy, your first purchase should be binoculars rather than a telescope because binoculars are even easier to use than a telescope and can really, and can show you things. Um, and so they're a great way to get started. And binoculars is part of the hobby of doing astronomy. Having a good pair of binoculars is always good, even if you do use a telescope because you get the wide fields, use both eyes, uh, those kinds of things. But very recently, I came across a discussion amongst the astronomical community in Canada here, the amateur astronomical, where somebody made the counter argument that, you know what, um, not everyone can hold binoculars very well. And it's not just restrict restricted to people that are older. You could have disabilities, um, or you could be too young, or it could be an age factor, but not everybody is able to hold binoculars steady, steadily enough to use them very well for, for astronomical purposes, because you are generally having to go up rather than horizontal, right? And another argument is that with, good, with a good pair of binoculars, there is the, the spacing, you know, the interocular spacing between the eyes. And some people have tr a lot of trouble with that in being able to use binoculars properly. And so, just to make the blankets, some people have the old advice that you had been for many years, if you're getting started, instead of rushing out to buy a telescope, just get binoculars, and that'll be the best way to do the hobby. But I think you have to you have to talk to the person, find out what find out about the person a little bit, because it could be that the binocular may not be the best choice. The tabletop small telescope, which can deliver the same low power fields. At least you've got the stability of the tabletop helping you hold the thing while looking up. So it's um, binoculars are good and they're great and they will and a good pair will last you forever in your hobby. But it's it's not a hundred percent guaranteed. I'm no longer of the opinion that it's always the blanket recommendation is hot. That's how you get started. If the person can hold them steadily, it is not going to uh, win win them over into the hobby. Is that what you're looking for or uh, Very anything fair. more specific? I was looking the other day at some in a, in a sports store and, and I couldn't believe the price range. You know, there was up to $2,000 for a oh, yeah. uh, 50 millimeter ones and they were down to, I think, $150. So I just, I would oh. like to have a pair for that specific purpose, what you said. But Only 2000 Yeah. <laughs> so, Only 2000 <laughs> I, I've looked through a pair of five thousand binocular five thousand dollar binoculars and it's just like, oh, are these ever good? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. 5, it's like looking through a five thousand dollar telescope too. Boy, is that ever good? Yeah, this you know, there's the eight by fifty, ten by fifty. Those are the, those are the yeah. sort, or or maybe the seventies. Yeah, that's you what know. I was wondering. Ten by fifty. Yeah. The most important thing is to try them. Like I wouldn't buy them offline at all. Yeah, um, try and, them. And so try them uh, because, well, I noticed you're wearing glasses. I'm wearing glasses. Um, I have a lot of astigmatism in my eyes, uh, which it's, if you don't know what astigmatism is, if you just take your glasses off and rotate and if things go, that's astigmatism. And... <laughs> Um, you really need um, what is called long eye relief binoculars because sometimes you just go click and you, you know you can't even see through them at all. And if if you've got a lot of astigmatism, you absolutely need to keep your glasses on. Otherwise, it's just a blur. And like I I have looked through two thousand dollar binoculars that have. You know, where it just goes clunk on the eyes and it's like this is useless oh. but there are binoculars that have are called long eye relief that's the the key word and i can keep my glasses on and it's beautiful so the the key thing is if you are um if you do have astigmatism test them out with your glasses on before making any decision 
Okay. Thank just, you very much. Yeah, and I think just just to reinforce it, unlike telescope, try them if you you know try them out by holding them in your hands, whether you have astigmatism or not, and look at something through them if you can. Like so, go to a go to a place that has them and try them out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Something else came in on the chat. I just saw something come in. Oh, Steve says his audio is lagging a bit. Okay. Yeah, um, just, just uh, for example, with continuing with the binocular thing, uh, for me, for eclipses, both solar and lunar, I love binoculars. It's two eyes. Um, it's You get to see some stars around the field. It's just magnificent. But as, as uh, Luca was quoting um, the, uh, some of the stuff on the web, there are some people, and I've got a really good friend, and I said, try my binoculars, you'll love these. And he goes, I still can't quite get... <laughs> and so, yeah, some people just have a really tough time with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, one other thing with binoculars, <laughs> um, especially when you get, oh, you know, $75. Sounds like a good deal, too good to be true, typically. Um, close one eye, look through, alternate with the other eye and just alternate closing eyes back and forth. And if your object in the distance, as far as you can see, shifts, especially up down, it's like, no, no, no. Yeah, they won't be aligned, so you'll never, you'll never see well through them. And, and it's, it's straight line for a headache. Yeah. All right. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, and if you think you might want to get help with something uh, next month's Astro Cafe on how to use a telescope, uh, the link's already. To the, for that one, you have to register. The link's already posted on the website, so you can go there now and just sign up for it right away. Uh, and then we'll round up the experts to help people. And then, uh, and I will be posting the video of this uh, by tomorrow on our YouTube channel for people that missed it. And then we can direct people that want to see it again there or, or watch it. All right, well, thanks everybody and have a good night. And don't forget the eclipse tomorrow night. Looks like it might be happening in our skies or it will be happening, but it looks like we might be happening to be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay, Luca. Good night. All right, thanks, good night. Luca. Ciao. Good night.